All right, there you go. Sweet. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. I'm finally gonna show you everything about my wing in the most condensed way possible and I got like 80 to 100 hours of footage we started putting together and the video is two, three hours long and we're trying to shorten it down. So I'm gonna give you the super short Reader's Digest version. So why did I do this? Machine, 42 ribs, and only four of them are shared. A lot of them have similar components, but they'll have one component at the front, a different component in the middle, and a different component at the back. And why would I spend this much money? Well, it's because I love aviation. And quite frankly, I've seen so many cool ideas of transforming morphing leading edges that turn into a cusp or a high-speed wing, but not get built. And I, I want to build something different and see if maybe it can make it into the market. I'm trying something very different. And in a much longer video I'll put out in a few days, I'll go into all the flow analysis that shows you why. But I have made a hyper stole twin slack that manipulates to fly faster and slower while growing the cord and camber of the wing almost 16 inches. But let me just kind of manipulate it a little bit and let you just see how it works. All right, so now I could play with that all day. <laughs> all right, so there's a bunch of arms not hooked up. There's a bunch of things that's just, like I said, crudely put together. I've even just taped my pivot arms to my torque tube for now because I need to get this in the plane. Scrappy's wing is going to grow in cord, drastically alter its camber, send a hyper velocity air increase over the top of the wing to hold more laminar flow to the back of a double slotted flat at a higher angle of attack than any wing I have tested, slatted, VG or other. All of that we want to do simultaneously while having a flap and a drooping aileron all happening at once 
so the pilot workload doesn't get too high. Scrappy's changing wing is going to be a switch toggle trigger on my throttle that I can click and it has six positions, five down, one up. The neutral position shapes the wing more like a conventional cub. That shape is what I'm flying with all the other cubs. My friends, if I want to loiter around at 80 or 100 miles an hour or 110 miles an hour, that's the position. The down positions are down five. One, two, three, four, five. I can go to any position I want. Five down is 50 degrees of flaps. When I manipulate the flap switch, this is how the wing grows. As it opens and closes, it actually lifts the double slats up off each other so they don't grind and then move forward and then they change so that they open up appropriately for the gap you need at the bottom and the gap at the top. I started playing a lot with slat positions. What's the biggest gap at the front versus back? What happens if I align two? How much does my center of lift move forward? And can it compensate for what I'm doing at the back of the wing so that I don't need so much elevator? I had to do thousands of iterations of flow analysis to adjust all my ideas from a drooping leading edge that stayed connected with a slat, a double slat, a morphing front of a wing, and then do a flow analysis on all of them. If this flap comes way down, I have to lift the elevator up or pull the stick in my lap and counteract that, which means I have a downward load here to try and hold the big nose up in the air, the prop blast pushing on it, which means if I needed 200 pounds of blast back here to hold the nose up with a over flapped aircraft, then I just lost 200 pounds of lift that the flap generated. So if this flap created four or 500 pounds of lift, I gave up part of it by the downward load, pivoting the plane and trying to hold the nose up. But I wanted to have more than just a big flap. I wanted to have a giant flap and a drooping aileron. They were not very popular and a lot of people found they actually hurt the performance of the aircraft. What ends up happening is you create so much flap and drooping aileron, the wing pitches up, you run out of elevator, you have more power trying to hold the nose up, and you just start fighting yourself. So you do a bigger, bigger an elevator, that creates more and more power, more and more blast, and you're just negating a portion of the benefit of your flap and your drooping aileron, so they just didn't seem to work well. If my wing and aircraft center of lift was in this position, it's actually more up here, but let's say this was the balance position, and I deploy flap, what ends up happening is it pitches the wing forward, and it ends up like this. So what do we do? Way at the back of the plane, we add an induced load by pulling back on the stick to keep the nose of the aircraft up. But the weight that I'm holding on my thumb at this position actually has just gone up by the weight it takes to counter the pitching moment. But the flap added more lift than the elevator took away. What I wanted to accomplish was not have to carry this extra load that the center of lift is carrying, which essentially makes the wing fly as if it's heavier. The wing loading is higher because you've just added an induced aerodynamic load. And I thought, you know, what if we could manipulate the center of lift on the wing in direct relation to the pitching moment of a large flap? And if we could manipulate the center of lift simultaneously without adding workload to the pilot, then maybe we could do a drooping aileron and then change 
the front of the wing so that as you create pitching moment and your center of lift shifts and you're trying to counteract it, you move the entire front of the wing forward, not have to add aft stick. You don't lose that downward force that's pivoting on your center of lift on the wing and the plane can fly flatter creating bigger lift and maximize the gain of a bigger flap, all of the gain of a drooping aileron, and none of the losses of a heavy aft stick. So when I started designing how to move that, I started working with a single slat or a single droop, and it worked to an extent. And if you're doing big flaps, I strongly encourage a single slat at least. Maybe retractable is great. But on Scrappy, with how big my flaps got and how much lift I wanted to create with a drooping aileron, one wasn't enough. It created, I still needed so much aft stick, I was giving up a ton of lift to counteract that induced load. So the idea of manipulating two components in direct relation to the movement of the back is where this silly idea came from. <laughs> anyway, I'm really excited about it. So let me tell you a little bit about how the air starts coming through this. On any traditional, any traditional slap, the air is compressed at the bottom, comes through the top. As it squeezes, it gets hyper velocity. That fast air comes over the top and it meets the slower air that it's joining up with. You get the blend of the two. The higher speed air helps drag your relative wind air and speed it up and help keep it laminar further to the back. What was really fun was playing with all the flow analysis of different styles of manipulating wings. And when I started playing with how to position two together, I found that the hypervelocity coming out of this one, paired with the hypervelocity coming out of the second one, gave me twice the volume of high speed air to help drag the slower moving air over the top and all the way to the back. And the numbers blew my mind. It absolutely, every time I did a flow analysis on it and I adjusted their positions, how far down, where their position relationship was, and I kept tweaking, getting worse sometimes, better sometimes. I got to the point that I was using a baseline wing with a slat, and I pitched it and took it down to an airspeed where the entire back half of the wing was completely stalled. The air was flowing the wrong direction, up the flap, up the wing, and a giant bubble flowing off, fully stalled, and no aileron control, at all, literally the air is going the wrong way over the aileron. And when the wing did that, I started comparing to this design and I was able to get so much speed over the top that in the same relative position, angle of attack and airspeed, the air stayed completely attached and laminar, not just across the wing, but to the very tip of the back of a 50 degree deployed flat and 100% of the aileron and absolutely no air going the wrong direction. So that got me excited and that's where this whole concept came from. Ideas from the past, blending current ideas, and then this silly idea. And we made the beginning of a new design. So I feel like I'm leaving so much out, it's ridiculous trying to fast pace how this works. So let's just kind of show you how some of these systems work. So many little details I'll go into later, but guys, everything down to where is the deadhead stop? I don't want any bars bending. I don't want even a chance for a bar to get into a bind or a compression situation. So everything on all of these mechanisms have an overrun area. The bearings that insert into the tracks are actually outside of the travel of all the components. What that means is once you put the bolts in, you can't even get the bearing over to the location that slides it out. It also means that all tracks have a buffer of 10% more range each direction, so it can never bind, 
There gets no added loads to these. So where is the hard stop on this? It's where it belongs, which is right on the motor. I'm using 100% of the travel of the linear actuator. It has an electrical and a mechanical stop. That is the most it can move. Nothing in any of this wing bottoms out against anything. They all bottom out against the linear actuator only. There's only one moving failure connection point that's the electric linear actuator flat motor. The torque tube runs the entire length of the wing. Every single component is machine matched, bearing set, and then embedded inside a bearing racetrack with side rails. All the bearings on every track is good to 30,000 RPM and over 600 pounds of load force, and there's multiple for every section. Two thumbs way, way up for our leading lady. But the more important thing is, there's nowhere in here for me to make an adjustment. I didn't want to have five moving components on each wing that someone could turn one turnbuckle in or out and get anything out of sync. It's also why I wanted to machine all my rigs out of one solitary part and slide them down the spars. I didn't want even the ability to connect to and have them be out of sync. That way, whatever is on this, is on the next, is on the next, and all of them run perfectly true. So if you watch this move, it's smooth as silk, but like I said, they're just bullshitting in there, no nuts, no spacers. Now in the full high-speed position, these actually rotate up and the back goes up and the ailerons go up. When I click one up, the ailerons reflex, the flaps reflex, and the front of the wing rotates just up into high-speed position. So that's my high-speed travel mode is everything partially reflexed and the front of the wing flat. So all that stuff I can program and set on the Garmin screen and interface to just a toggle, how many times I touch the toggle and then it will show me on the screen. The slats slide into the pockets all the way down so there's an inch and a quarter engagement in each one and it can't get out rather than screws so that it's actually a mechanical lock and there's no way for the slat to move and get out. And then some of the challenges was how to get a slat in a slat moving out of a wing. And so you can actually see a bottle nose front on it right here. And if you were to look close, the bottle nose goes way out to the front and the bearings are on the inside and my slats have to pass through each other. One of the really interesting things that I found it was an idea I had just off of all kinds of people trying to hyper accelerate the air over the top was that when I played with the slats, I started to find the correct position of the gap on the bottom relative to the gap on the top. And then I started playing with what happens when you accelerate the air that's compressed on the bottom over the top of the wing, and then you add another one doing the same, and here's what happened. I tried a big moving wing with a bigger opening, and the velocity of the air actually just stayed similar to a single slant, which is impressive. But as I started to get to high angle of attack, the air started to detach at a similar place, at a similar angle of attack, at a similar airspeed to a slatted wing. However, when I compressed the air and sped it up, it's trying to drag the relative wind up to its airspeed. The airspeed coming through the compressed zone is much faster, and then the air coming over the top is slower, and when they meet, they blend. What I realized that was really, actually it blew my mind. On the flow analysis, I started to find that as that air blended, it sped up, and then it started to re-pair up with relative wind or the aircraft's true airspeed as you got further back. But when I staged two together, I got the increased velocity on this one Matching up with the increased velocity on the second, now I have two high-speed sections of air grabbing the third slow air, and when a single slatted wing stall, started stalling and working its way up to here, the double slatted wing carried the air faster all the way back to a 50-degree 
deployed flat, which has just blew my mind. And so then I started to realize that if we could pair it up right and get them to move in harmony, there'd be no workload for the pilot. You could have much higher angle of attack, which is not a goal of mine. It actually just makes it harder to see out your window, you're dragging your tail and you got a long fall on the way down, it's hard to hit your spot. I actually wanted to accomplish something very different, which is what this does, is just increase the wing, increase the air over the top, which keeps my ailerons fully laminar at a much slower airspeed and higher angle of attack if you chose to do so by a such a drastic margin that I kind of just want to wait and tell you more about it when we test fly it because it's actually hard to believe. Yes. Are you sure this will work? <laughs> How much the velocity increased by pairing up the double twin slats on the front. The other thing it's done is it's caused the wing to be able to fly more flat. Instead of having to go really high angle of attack and using a lot of elevator and a whole lot of prop, the wing just becomes huge. And the lift stays centered. I don't lose it off my tail and the plane can fly unbelievably slow at a level attitude. Critical angle of attack is when the wing starts to produce less lift rather than more lift. So we get more lift, more lift, more lift, starts to equalize, then less lift. That's critical angle of attack. Much further it stalls, you drop a wing, maybe you lose aileron control. But what was interesting on this one is rather than going up and having the critical angle of attack be really close to a stall where the air detached from the back of the wing and swirled backwards on the backside, this plane could keep going steeper and steeper and steeper and the air was so fast over the top from two slats pointed high angle of attack to the wind, hyper velocity increase shoved over the back, the air stayed laminar and the curl of the air trying to go backwards lifted 14 inches away from the wing. And I've never seen that on any flow analysis I have ever done. That air actually pushed a high velocity all the way over the ailerons and flaps when every other flow analysis showed it completely detached and the air actually locked, dropped back over and flowing the wrong direction up the back. This one stayed laminar all the way back. So it'll be really interesting because what I was able to do was check the X and Y drag coefficients on the flow analysis and I could see that I can get to the point where the wing no longer carries the weight of the aircraft and it's going to start sinking. And that's even with high power. And you can just keep going and it just keeps sinking. Rather than what it would normally do is get past critical angle of attack, stall, let go, drop a wing. So it'll be really interesting to see because the amount steeper it went while staying aileron control was, was so staggering it's, it's hard to believe, so we just gotta try it. The idea here is let's see if we can advance aviation and try something new, and maybe someday this idea can roll into another, maybe these will make it into aircraft. So what's happening now as these double-slotted hyper slats move forward, and by the way, they, they look like slats. I actually changed the shape a bit to improve the blending of the two, but they're actually huge. And I had to do two because as it comes back and they pair up, they make a really flat cord line. And if I tried to do it with one, it made a kink in the wing. So I really had to change the shape a bit, but it gets really flat and the air stays very true over in high speed position. But the center of lift is directly moving as these go in and out to directly compensate for what the drooping ailerons and flaps are doing now, I have to be careful. I still wanted the aircraft to want to nose over for safety. So I didn't want to grow the front of the wing so much that I actually added would need forward pressure. I wanted it to be a little bit aft, but I certainly didn't want it to be 
having to pull it way back to my gut and add in power because my center of lift had moved so far when my flaps and ailerons were deployed that I was running out of my back rear stick and adding that load. So ultimately, I took a cub, tried to pair up where its movement would be on a small, single, standard flap, no drooping ailerons, no double slots, no larger wing, where when you slow down, you slightly need a little more aft elevator, just a little bit, so it feels and flies like normal, but I've actually grown 16 inches in camber arc line. The length of the camber line has grown a full 16 inches all the way across the entire wing, ailerons and all. You can see these bars right here, <laughs> my bars to nowhere. They literally are hooked to nothing. It's just representing what I will put here that will actually attach to this little pivot right here. This is a pivot that will move when the bottom side of my main torque tube rotates. On this one, it's real easy to see. The bottom pivot connects to the flap and it moves in concert. Everything in the correct position to keep the center of lift and maximize the lifting area is automatic. This one, I just haven't machined them yet. <laughs> I need to put in a different length arm, but I move this out of the way. It will connect to here. There's another bracket that brings cables in. And as the cable loops through these, comes back to another part you don't see. As this moves, it moves this cable pulley assembly on both sides of the plane at the exact same time, and they go to the aileron. As it rotates, the cable shorten on one side of the aileron controls while lengthening on the other, and they're doing it together, which allows both ailerons to droop all in one tight little mechanism coming back to a pivot at the back. And both of them are drooping together, but your stick never moves. So as this changes the length, never changing the length of the cable, of course, just lengthening the one side and loosening the other to allow a droop, the cables can still spin back and forth with your stick and get 100% aileron control at 25 degrees of droop. It's hard to see, but right at the back of this bearing set and that track, also the front and the back, this these slats actually go and then drop down into, a, into position. What that does is two things. One, when it goes into high speed position, you see how high that arc is, like a traditional cub wing? Now look how flat this has become. If you actually were to not see the middle of this and just profile this wing, it is a really fast wing. I mean, it's not a race wing by any means, but it's an extremely low drag wing in comparison to a high lift wing. But what I didn't want is these slats to drag as they moved out because this is moving out at twice the speed of this because this one's got to go so far forward and I didn't want the slats to drag. So there's a little hump in there that causes the slats to lift off each other and then come out. So they give themselves 50 thousandths of an inch clearance. The slats are pocketed in here with a 50 thousandths inch aluminum step, which means there's 100 thousandths of an inch gap so any deflection or heat or movement or air pressure, none of the paint will ever touch. Gosh, I'm really excited about it. I'm gonna do a longer video, guys, because I'm leaving out so much, so much about the engineering, so much about the load, so much about the flow analysis and how I got there. I'll put a much longer video together. I really need to stop playing with it. I've been moving it up and down over and over and over. You guys know the drill. There's enough talking. I got a lot to do. Let's get back to work.
Hey, Mark. All right, here you go. Pretty sweet.